kickoff from Feely. And we'll find out very early about the footing with Purdue getting the ball first. The way they feature their fullback shot. It's going to be interesting because when they had a field similar to this at Penn State, Mark Allstott seemed to have his trouble. So you're absolutely right. A great deal of the offense is so dependent upon number 40. And with the wind up, he really needs some help. Gets into it. It is going to be Lee Johnson losing it at the one to start the contest. That does a good job to get it across the 15. So the Boilermakers offensively coming out. First and 10 to their own 16. Copenhaver, the inside linebacker, making the stop on special teams. Trevsker, good quarterback, but he's going to need a lot of help from the tailback, Edwin Watson. Watson coming off his best day as a Boilermaker, though. A career best, 194 yards of the win over Wisconsin last Saturday. Alfred, the wide receiver, grew up in the suburb of Detroit, Oak Park, Michigan. The only wide receiver to catch a touchdown toss for the Boilermakers this year. And Damon Lewis, with his first start of the year, the offensive line banged up, and Mark Fisher, the regular left guard, he is out with an ankle injury. So the Boilermakers first and 10 out of the eye, their own 16. All stop. So no gain on that carry. Lost maybe a half a yard. Horn there, as well as Fiesel. Defensively, for the Wolverines, led by the young man out of Carter High School in Dallas, William Carr, stops on the team in tackles behind the line of scrimmage. Buckus Award finalist, the inside linebacker, Jarrett Irons. He's out of the Woodlands, Texas. Charles Woodson, a true freshman, starting on the corner. Not your basic true freshman, though. Six year football in the state of Ohio last year. Second and 11, lost in a yard for all stop. Just going to the backfield early for Purdue. Well, this is a good decision to defer with the weather the way it is. Michigan comes on the field and hopes and goes three and punt. Now they come up with a third and ten, and this is not <clears throat> this does not bode well for the Purdue offense going into the win with a quarterback who's not that adept at throwing the ball. That field position, obviously, Todd, is very important in a game with weather like this. So third and eleven. 15 for the border makers. Jets to the southpaw, dumping it for all shot. And he won't get to the marker. Only a couple of yards to 17. So three and out for Purdue on their first possession of the contest. But Tepster was, was really lucky just to get that off. Does a good job of pursuing all stop from the back side. Very good sequence for the Michigan defense early on. So now Amani Schumer getting ready for the punt. Rob Dignan. He had problems in the Ohio State game. That's the only real game where they had problems, though, in the punting department. Where he had two blocks and lost another, but scrambled to pick the first down with a bad snap. Flag on the play. Oh, he slipped and fell. Look at that. And a dead ball foul anyway coming up with a flag on the near side. Well, the left tackle move for Purdue, and that's going to move back five yards, and Degna's got to be happy about that simply because of the fact that now he'll reestablish his footing and hopefully get the kickoff. Toomer only standing at 35 yards. Take a, look, take a look right here at the left tackle. He's going to move just a little bit. Just enough for the officials to see it. and take a look at the footing for Degna. The left foot just slips. And, <laughs> and that's not going to be the first, the last time that's going to happen today. It's just difficult. The tarp only went out from 25-yard line to 25-yard line. So the footing is going to be particularly precarious inside the 20s on both ends, Joe. You bring up a good point because it's been raining since about, what, 2 or 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Just the past 24 hours, precipitation. So now Degner from his own end zone. The rain is now turning to snow flurries. Tumor stays away from it as it dies outside of the 45, just inside the 47. A 35-yard punt. And Joel, I was going to say that there he was standing, standing at 29 yards. You see the tarp earlier, as we, as we mentioned, take a look at what it's covering. Basically, about the 22-yard line to the other side is about the 25. So the so-called the so-called red zone is going to be the wet zone today. So the Michigan offense for the first time today 
led by sophomore quarterback Brian Greasy out of Columbus High School in Miami. They start tailback. Bianca Patuka with a first down inside the 35 to the 33, a gain of 14. And the lineup with Greasy starting for only the sixth time in his career. How will he respond to this type of weather? It was cold at Michigan State last week, but nowhere near the precipitation that we're experiencing this afternoon. So that's the question mark going in for Brian Greasy. Look at the rest of the Michigan offense in just a moment. First and 10 Wolverines. Bianca Batuka once again inside the 30. Now to the 29. Good yardage again for Bianca Batuka on first down. Leo Perez making the stop. Mercury Hayes, their big play, their home run threat out of Houston's Washington High School, leads the Wolverines with a 20 yard average. John Runyon, second team All Big Ten performer, has got the most experience up front for the Wolverines, the left tackle for Clint. Probably a gain of a little more than four, second and six now for Michigan. Started with the ball for two territory, and the border makes 47. Flying out. Bianca Batuka once again. Short yardage this time. Inside the 33, Washell, the right tackle, in on that hit. Defensively, Washell, according to the coaches, the senior from Greenwood, Indiana, playing the best ball of his entire career over the last three games. GKO Kiefer, out of West Lafayette. He's only a sophomore, started as a true freshman, and now as a sophomore, leads the Boilermakers in tackles. And another one who started as a true freshman, the sophomore Derek Brown, a real leader now in the secondary, the sophomore for Lauderdale. Joel don't be surprised too on third and five to see him run the ball because I think because of the conditions, even with the wind at their back, this could be four down territory. Moving up front, the Akabatuka in trouble. And he loses it, but gets it back and takes a lick at the same time, opts out of the 30, 32. Do we finally get a flag because it appears that Perez, the left tackle, may have been offside for Purdue. I don't see a flag, no flag on the play. There was also movement up front on that side of the line, the offensive line for Michigan. Take, take, a, take a look at the middle of the line right in here. Take a look and see if he jumps before the ball is snapped. Well, there was a little bit of movement, but evidently the officials decided that he did not encroach. And as a result, there is no flag if Jakob Atuma gets the loss. And shows how much I know they are going to try a 50-yarder, Joel. It is going to be a 50-yard attempt for Remy Hamilton. It'll come out of the hold of Remersma, the tight end. High snap is down. And does he get it inside the upright? Well, it was right on line, but short. So the 50-yard attempt comes up a couple of yards shy. Still no scores. We'll be right back to Ann Arbor. He stood side by side with Mike Boren when he laid 90,000 feet of sod. We carried the team's equipment when Mike Jr. pitched his first game. Then we chauffeured the whole family off to Angelo's to celebrate. GMC Sierra with standard four-wheel ABS and the same steel ladder frame built into our commercial trucks. It's a truck built for the way you live. Sierra is built for life. See the full line of GMC trucks at your GMC truck dealer. Chicken McNuggets make you feel like a kid again? Can they bring you closer together? Can they give you a thrill? Can they be just the break you've been waiting for? Of course they can. Can they make you see double? As a matter of fact, yes. With McDonald's two for two. Two tempting six-piece chicken McNuggets or two McChicken sandwiches for just two dollars. So, can they give two empty, unfulfilled hands something very entertaining to do? Absolutely. Have you had your break today? Good news, the rain subsided. The bad news, it's turned into the white stuff, and welcome back once again to Michigan Stadium. Joel Myers along with Doc Christensen, and the wind is really gushing close to 30, 35 miles an hour. First and 10, Warner Makers, their own 33. Now for the first 
time some of the other that all shot is Edwin Watson. Not much there, a yard at the most. ESPN's presentation of college football is being brought to you this afternoon by GMC Trucks, the strength of experience. Well, this is the 45th meeting in this long rivalry between Michigan and Purdue. It started all the way back in 1890 before it's over. This one may rank in the weather category. Well, I gotta tell you, if this is the classic of those people who want to sit home and yearn for the days of Lambeau Field and Bloomington, Minnesota, man, you got it today. Now third and long once again for the Boilermakers. Their head coach Jim Coletto. Well, as we mentioned at the top, Joel, 252 yards per game. A lot of that padded last week against Wisconsin when they had two backs over 190 yards, nearly 400 yards rushing for Watson and Allstott. Don't look for that today simply because of the footing and the weather. A freak play or a turnover is going to win this game, Joel. Third and 12 now. Not exactly what you're teaching your fullback. point here, Joel, to begin the game, if you remember, number 40 had short sleeves on. He was doing the manhood thing, you know, with the short sleeves. Now all of a sudden he says, hey, hey, the stretch is the better part of Valley. Very lucky just to hold on to that football. One of the few guys that you see skill position players now in college football that does not have the tack of five gloves, but the long sleeves, yes. They like the sprint draw at Purdue, don't they? <laughs> At this point, they like anything that will gain yardage. So the second straight, three and out with a punt now. Negative. Now, someone needs to point out to Toomer, he's too far back. Last time he was at 30 yards and it was short. Now he's standing at about 41. And the wind is oh, never going to get there. Of Dignan. Out of the north end zone. Dies inside the 30. So now Michigan charting in their own territory in the 28 as we check in with Mike Tirico. Mike? Joel, you have snow, they have rain in Chapel Hill. North Carolina goes three and out, but they don't get the out. Mike Thomas, the punter, is also the quarterback. The kick is blocked and recovered for a Mario Edwards touchdown. Noel, 5-7. All right, Noel's trying to come back from that setback against Virginia in one of the best college football games I've seen in a long time. They've got rain, we've got snow. You think they'll trade? <laughs> Rysler Arena never looks so good from the distance. Throw greasy on first down. Reverse bump with a nice grab. He had the linebacker O'Connor right on his hip, but he's got it across the 35 to the 36. You couldn't have covered any better than that. I don't understand how that ball was able to find its way in there. As you mentioned, O'Connor right in the middle of the field is right there. It's not like Remersma ran a great route. Watch the middle backer. Watch the middle backer right here. He's going to come over and be right there. He slips a little bit. Look where the hand is. It's right there, right on top of him. The ball still is able to sneak in there. Great concentration on the part of Remersma. Two seconds. Had a couple. Bianca Batuka. Close to the first down marker. Right at the 39. Well, ESPN is your home for college football, and later today, 5 o'clock Eastern, Warmer climbs Auburn heading to Georgia for his half of a five-time doubleheader. Then at 8 o'clock, Ace Florida, number three of the nation, taking on the Gamecocks in South Carolina. Don't forget to catch up with all of today's scores and highlights of the residents in college football scoreboard at 11 o'clock Eastern. And Danny Wolf is starting in that one, right? He is back. Oh, okay. Under seven minutes left and the first 15 minutes of play. We'll give you down the distance as often as possible early because late may be difficult. First and 10 outside of the 39. I like it. The play fake for Greasy. He had his man wide open going for Mercury Hayes but overshot it inside the 45. The average goes that the offense has the advantage on a field like that simply because they know where they're going. You saw Hayes on the short post. Greasy had him plenty of time, just didn't deliver. Take a look in the middle of your field. Hayes is going to be coming from the left. Look at Greasy as a result of the play action. Plenty of time. He just overthrows him right there wide open. And a 5'11", Hayes just can't get up. He does, he does get hit at the end, but he had a good four and a half seconds. But, ooh, took a shot there from Jamie Marcel. As usual, breaks his tackles early on the run and takes it all the way to the 47 for a game of seven. We go back now to Mike Dorico. Mike? 
Joel first drive on a windy day at Chestnut Hill with the rain heading that way. Good start for Miami. Ryan Clement, 56 yards to the backup tight end. Gerard Gaffnick had the extra point. Miami looking to win a sixth straight game. It's BC by seven. Thanks, Mike. Miami certainly turning things around after a sluggish beginning against UCLA in the first game of the year. Jim Gilletto, Southern California, bundled up here in the Midwest. And now it's third and three at the 47 for the Wolverines. Plenty of time for Greasy. And it draws the flag as he tried to hit. He got the Pachuca in the flat right at the marker. But a flag normally where you see a holding call. It seemed like he had a little too much time there. So Purdue will most likely decline, bringing up the punting situation. Michigan should be able to capitalize, you would think, with a wind at their back and a big wind at that. Holding on the offense. Deep high. I wonder if the temptation there, though, is possibly to take it if for no other reason than to get yourself some field position. Now the punter has an opportunity to get it inside the 20 and, and he can play the field position game. You know? Head coach Lloyd Carr, 7-2 so far his first year as the head coach for the Wolverines. 15 seasons here, though, as an assistant under Bo Beckler, as well as Gary Muller, most recently defensive coordinator. And now... Barrett Harris kicks it away with a flag down of the play. Bringing it back is Butterfield. And Butterfield, waiting for something to develop, gets into the 17-yard line. And check that, Craig Allen rather bringing it back after a punt of 43 yards. You know, Joel, even though the punters have the win, the footing is so precarious, you can see how careful they're kicking the ball. Now, if I, was, if I was Purdue, I'd take that simply because you want to see if the guy can slip and fall again as the punter. If indeed they do take it, take a close look. Take a close look at how the punter is kicking. It's almost as if he's walking on eggshells. He doesn't want to slip and shank it. And Mike Allstock says, yes, pats the official on the butt and says, let's do it over again. That's what happens when you're all Big Ten. When you rush for 1,000 yards, you can pat the officials on the rear end. And you make the call. I'm the offense. Did not have six yards down the line of scrimmage. Five yards. Repeat four thousand. Todd, did you like the work of the return man, Allen, for the mere fact that he was waiting for everybody else to slip and slide and possibly over-pursue the play? Yeah, that was. But the one thing here is that he should be standing just a little bit shorter. Right now, seven... Well, he's right at about 41 yards. That should be good. What the, what the special teams coach should be telling him is just run up there and make the fair catch and give us a decent field position. But take a look at the footing here. Watch the punter. Very careful. Very careful. With the wind of his back, gets into a beauty. So now Allen loses it at the 10, scrambles, and still can't get it inside the 5. Michigan has the football. Coming up with it for the Wolverines. Their linebacker, their reserve linebacker, Ben Hoff, the sophomore from Charlotte, North Carolina. The Periscaris does get off a terrific punt, but this is really a poor job by Allen getting after the ball. Now watch right here, he slips and falls right there. That should be an easy ball, but instead the play is made really there on the part of Mark Bullock, the offensive tackle. His hustle enables the recovery. Poor job by Allen getting the ball, but a great effort by Bullock in keeping it free so his teammate could get it. So they took the penalty and the punter really got into it. And it burns the water makers of Purdue. So instead of the ball of their own 17 after the first punt, the gamble didn't pay off. And now the bull backfield. As the Wolverines for William Carr in there, Carr gets it looking for a second touchdown in as many games with a flag on the play. He takes it inside the one. Now they're going to move that back because of motion. And this is going to make for some interesting play calling. Memories of the bridge. Watch Larry McGrew at the end of this play, number 50. Ouch! Just got run over by that 300-plus pounder. Now, Carr isn't quite that heavy. And then last week, yeah, Michigan State, a three-yard touchdown run, the first of the career of William Carr. Now, he may not be that heavy, but he certainly moves the pile. 
Michigan picks up the mark off. It'll take it back to the seventh. Joel, I'm going to be bold here. Pat Patterson is going to have to get
shifted, he motioned to his right. Everybody is gone. Bowens is the man who's supposed to be out there. He doesn't know whether to go after the tight end or to go after the quarterback, and in not making the immediate decision, that affords Trevsker the opportunity to cut up the field and set up shot first down in midfield. That is his longest run of the season. First and 10 right at the midfield strike. Tailback, and we'll see plenty of beauty today because the back of Corey Rogers, his senior from Chicago, he didn't even make the trip with a sprained ankle. So basically, all stop to watch it every step of the way today for the Boilermakers and five on first down. Well, the first couple of series they were dom they were being dominated by Michigan, but now they're starting to go against the flow. Take a look at Watson. The hole is supposed to be on the left side, but he cuts back against the grain, goes to the right, picks up five yards. That's what Purdue has to do. They cannot go directly at Michigan. They have to do things a little more deceptive. Second and five at the 45. for two as we head back to Mike Tirico. Mike? Joel, this McDonald's breakaway takes us to Chapel Hill. We all remember what happened the last time Ward Dunn touched the ball about a half yard short against Virginia. First offensive snap against North Carolina. He gets it and goes. 43 yards for the touchdown. The Seminoles lead the heels by 14. And you know what, Joel? I still think that was a great call. I know we didn't get in, but I still maintain that was a great call at the end of the game. People are still talking about that game. That's the kind of game it was. 33 now at the Michigan 43. Dexter running out of room and overshooting Black for the tight end. Tough footing to turn around and try to regroup that quickly. Well, Steve King, the strong safety, was outstanding in coverage. They had the play action pass. Take a look. Take a look to the left of your screen. He wants to get the tight end, the ball on the cross. But right behind him, you can see right here, there's King in outstanding coverage. There's nothing he can do except get rid of the ball there and set up shot for the punt. He takes a beating there at the end. Wow. That was some shot. Flew about four yards in the air. Already the third punt of the day from Jesus to Colton Springs, Florida, Rob Degman. Cooper standing outside of the tent for the Wolverines. Had a third catch. And it's taken in outside of the 14 by Amani Cooper. We do have a flag on the play. Now, notice that in that case, the special teams coach did get to him. Well, don't forget, the NFL continues on ESPN on Sunday night. John Elway, the Denver Broncos, going into Philly. Trying to slow down Ricky Waters and the offensive unit of the Eagles. Both teams 5-4, and four, trying to make it to the playoffs. Denver, Philadelphia, Sunday night on ESPN. Joel, what I was about to say is at that time he did. He stood right at 30 yards and said, we're just going to take the fair catch. That's exactly what he did, as opposed to letting a bounce and possibly get inside the five. Bianca Batuka with a single step. And on first down, he's into the secondary. And he's got a first down, 11 yards for Bianca Batuka. Brought down by Crick, the left and the co-captain for the border makers. Nine carries, 36 yards for the junior from Quebec. He is averaging 132 yards a game on the ground. That is 13th best of the nation. All side, as we mentioned at the top of the telecast, 12th best of the nation, 135 yards a game. The eye of the two compels to the media that almost looked like Greasy had problems with a snap from the outset. Well, good penetration of the part of Craig Williams, the right defensive end, to slow him up. Well, the snow has subsided. Fortunately, as you see Greasy squinting, looking over the sideline for the play. And earlier, the visibility was tough, so you can understand why he was squinting. Final few seconds of the opening quarter in a second and ten situation for the Wolverines.
most popular guy at Michigan Stadium. A young millionaire in the making with the hot chocolate concession. And welcome back to the place they call the Big House. Joel Meislow with Todd Pitchens for first and ten at the 38. And the new running back is Ed Davis giving Bianca Patuka a bit of a break. That last run, 37-yarder for Bianca Patuka. Well, he certainly deserves it. 11 carries for 73 yards in the first quarter. This is really all on his own. Take a look at the tackle. You can see the pit right there. Take a look at the tackles that he breaks. One, two, and once again, he just breaks through the arm tackles, as you mentioned, Joel, showing some speed here and balance. You know, trying to get shoved out of bounds. He was able to get an extra eight yards because he didn't go out of bounds immediately. Davis on the carry with a couple. On the second and eight, and the 35 for Purdue. Three to nothing lead for Michigan. Davis stays in there. The hammers it down to the 32, close to the 31. Brought down by the end, Williams once again. Eight straight wins for Michigan over Purdue. Last win coming in at 84 for the Boilermakers, so if there's a little ill will there, and they were jostling at the bottom of that pile, you can understand why. Last time they beat them here at Michigan Stadium, 1966. Who is the quarterback for Purdue? Bob. Very. We're going to get into Greasy a little bit later, and obviously he's here today to watch his son. Three very dramatic wins for Bob Greasy. And the offensive corner you saw there talking with co head coach Lloyd Carr wasn't very happy about what he just saw. Two around in single coverage should have been an easy catch and throw, but it wasn't. On fourth and five, he's got Mercury Hayes wide open. He had a big cushion on the corner back, Derek Winston. First down, Michigan to the 19. Much too large a cushion. Basically, he ran the exact same play to the other side with more yardage. And you're right, that, that was just way too much. Watch the left of your screen when he makes the catch. Look at the gap. Winston's a good nine yards off, and you just can't afford that. I realize that Hayes is a speedster, but you had to figure that fourth and five, they're not going to throw into the end zone. The Akabatuka still on the bench after that 37-yard run. Ed Davis stays in the backfield behind George Howell. Seventh play of the drive is starting from 15. Davis has a huge hole. Down to the 12, inside the 13. We check in once again with Mike Tirico. Mike? Joel, how's the Virginia going to bounce back from the Florida State game? A letdown, perhaps? Down 3 nothing at Maryland? This short kickoff becomes a disaster. The returner slips. It's recovered by Paul Jackson. Maryland scores, goes for two, makes it, and they lead by 11. All right, Mike. Well, Virginia opened the season right here in Ann Arbor. We've seen that play just a few times. That final attempt by Mercury Hayes with four seconds. Love it, snap the ball. You got to pick up a whale of an arm side stick, though. <laughs> the Agabatuka into the backfield of the big way once again, and it's going to be first in goal in Michigan. Right around the set. You know, it's interesting, talking with offensive coordinator Fred Jackson yesterday, he mentioned the fact that Yagabatuka, you know, 37 carries against a very physical Michigan State team. He said, I don't anticipate that that's going to happen again. He said, yeah, right. He had 11 carries in the first quarter, now it's 12 carries. Take a look at the end where he ends up landing. Splash! Just a little rain over the last day, day and a half here in Ann Arbor. There's the offensive coordinator for the Wolverines. Yeah, you know, you say that you're only going to give the guy so many carries. It's kind of like in Dallas with Emmett Smith. No, 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 no. We'll hold back. Yeah, right. When crunch time comes, you want your ball in the hand of your herd. There's the goal. Ned Davis barely makes it back to the original line of scrimmage. That's Jamie Washell again. And the thing that's interesting here is that this is where they struggled before. Remember, they got inside the five, and everybody assumed it was a gimme. Not so here. Purdue rising up. How about play action here? What do you think? You liked it on first down the last time, and they didn't go with it uh, for you. Well, second down now. What do you think? I think they're looking at it now as an option. Well, and they split out to the wide side, so I really like it. Mercury Hayes. And Davis is in this set. Two wide receivers, two tight ends. They don't like the call. Davis almost. 
Jones got away. And before Derek Brown, the free safety, helped that trick to close it down. I think what Brown is making some hits this series, even though some of them have been downfield. If he doesn't make that play, Davis is a nice job spinning off and almost was able to maintain his balance and walk in. But Brown came up with the run support, and now third down, it becomes incredibly predictable that you're going to throw the ball. Just about four minutes gone by in the second quarter. Three to nothing lead for the Wolverines on the 25-yard field goal by Remy Hamilton. And now a timeout has been called by Purdue. So they get things together defensively and we'll come right back to Ann Arbor. Michigan looking for more as we're walking you back to Ann Arbor. Joel Myers along with Josh Christensen. Wolverines leading by three. It doesn't get any easier for Purdue after this one. They've got Northwestern next week. So Michigan today, Northwestern next week. Two opponents combined 15 of three for the Watermakers of Purdue. And Purdue to get to a bowl game. They've got to win their final three. It's the 11th play of the drive. Started for the Wolverines all the way back at their own 15. Chris Howard, the single set. And a third and goal point behind Mercury Hayes. He was open the crossing pattern, working on Derek Brown, the free safety. Well, Hayes isn't very happy about it because they got what they wanted. They wanted the three wide receiver set. He comes on the crossing pattern. The crossing pattern going the other direction gets him open. There he is. He's open by about two steps, but the ball is behind him. And Waddell once again putting pressure on the quarterback, Greasy. Well, again, again, Joe, Purdue's got to be very happy about a defensive stand. The now 22-yard field goal attempt coming up for Hamilton, the junior from Boca Raton, Florida. And it's blocked. Blocked by the Watermakers, so they hold. And they stop a huge drive and turn it all the way back into Michigan 15. I think it was Derek, Derek Winston. Winston. Derek Winston's the one that comes off the corner, and more and more you're seeing that. It's amazing to me how that happens. Take a look, take a look right here from the top. He's going to come. Poor job. Look at the angle. He gets the angle that he wants, lays in. I think along with him, not only was it it wasn't just Winston. I believe along with him, John Crick is the one that comes up the middle and gets a piece of it too. Boy, that defense is excited, justifiably so. So now first and ten for Dew. Still only a three-point lead for Michigan. They've enjoyed the great field position, but they have not taken advantage of the situation. Thousands of yards right there it certainly dictate that they've been dominating the game, but as you mentioned, the horse is zip. Watson, the tailback, one of the best runs of the day. Across the 15 to 18, gets seven on first down. ESPN's presentation of college football is being brought to you by Video Guide, the on-TV program guide with news, weather, and sports. It's about time. And by Buick and your local Buick dealers. Remember Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. So a pick me up for the watermakers from their defensive unit. Now to just carry over to the offensive unit. Second and three after the seven-yard pickup by Ed Watson. Number again. He won't make it to Parker. Barely makes it back to the line. Hop in there. He recovered that fumble down of the two after the pop by Craig Allen. Another score is around the Big Ten. Saw Northwestern with an early 3-0 lead over Iowa. And Northwestern riding some kind of high now. Well, yeah, but you know what? With regards to Northwestern, I'm really getting weary of people talking about whether or not it's a fluke that they're at the top of the standings. I, I broadcast their game against Wisconsin. It's not a fluke. They play some serious defense. Darnell Austin is as good as anyone in the country. 390 yards on the ground. Almost like Austin kind of numbers for Northwestern. And they barely crashed it. Looking the wrong way, he is annihilated by Jason Horn, the defensive end. Jason Horn was somebody who had been defensive tackle the first four games of the season. Now they get him back a defensive tackle, the pass rush. And now he gets his ninth sack. He had eight in the first four games, none in the last three. Ouch. Take a look at this shot. Oh, man, oh, man that hurts. That really hurts. Oh. So while he's trying to get away from Sam Sword, excuse me, Jason Horn is there. Bring it out once again. Dick is back at his own goal line. Amani Schumer at the midfield strike. And it gets away 
Schumer inside the 40. Nice roll. As it's cut down at the 31. So Michigan gets it back, but surprisingly, with the field position they've had, they only lead it by three. Michigan has it first and 10 at their own 31, but they are only up by three, and I say only because Purdue offensively has had it four times, three and out with a punch, and the Boilermakers have only picked up one first down thus far. Bianca Matuka up the middle, 4-4 four, four to the 35. Well, also you have to point out the fact, Joel, that twice now they've been inside the five-yard line, and, and instead of coming away with a possible 14 points, they've only come away with three. A lot of credit has to go to that Purdue defense. How much residual effect on a loss to your arch rival, especially last Saturday at Michigan State? Well, you know, when I was chatting with Fred Jackson, the offensive coordinator for Michigan, he made the point that while everybody says that maybe their rivalry was Ohio State or Penn State, he said that it's a very serious rivalry with Michigan State. It's an in-state deal, and as a result, I think you're right. I think there is some lingering effect to that. Four on first down for the Oxford who stays in the backfield. Gets it once again, second and six. Buried in the backfield, Greg Smith, outstanding play for the junior from Chicago. Well, don't forget ESPN 2's complete college football coverage continues later today. Scores on ice interviews, sports night college football edition coming your way at 6 and then at 7. Wisconsin led by running back Carl McConnell, quarterback Darrell Babel, and Babel the Golden Gophers of Minnesota. It's the Paul Bunyan Axe game. College football all coming your way later today on ESPN 2. Both teams have had their problems so far on third down. To find 0 for 9, and now it's a third and 6 coming up for the Wolverines. Plenty of time for Greasy. Now, that was thrown behind, as they call it an incomplete pass, behind Greasy. Ed Davis couldn't get his hands on it, as it was off his fingertips. Well, that was it, almost like a lateral. It was close. It was close. You're going to get a chance to see it. Watch where his feet are. Right there, they're right at about the 30-yard line, and so, no, that's a forward pass. Good call by the official, but for whatever reason, Brian Greasy's accuracy is non-existent today. Certainly a lot of that has to do with the weather, but he's had some people open. He just hasn't been able to give them the ball. It is going to be out of a dotty instead of Allen this time. Oh, Terrace. Terrace, Terrace. Barely got a piece of it. What a break for Purdue. On the exchange, they get it back now, first and 10 when we return at their own 46. Jeff Wafer, Paul Perez, Harris to go to the bench after a punt like that. Not many guys talking to him right now. The punt leads it to the 46 for the border makers, Joel Einstein, Pistons, and back in Ann Arbor. That field position has started to drive so far today for Purdue. Watching the tailback. Yard is all he's going to get. Irons, the Buckus Award finalist, over there to make the play. Well, you mentioned that punt. Take a look at where the where his foot hits the ball. It's slowed down and, and, and very slow. Watch right here at the end. Watch the ball hit. Look at the wind move it, and he hits it right at the end. Those of you that are hardcore football followers remember some 10 years ago when Sean Landetta of the Chicago Bears actually whiffed in a playoff game against the Giants. So I guess I guess from the positive standpoint, he didn't whiff, Joel. At least he got a piece. They're now seven and nine. Speaking of a piece, look at a piece of the turf that had watched his face pass. And watch it. It's not bothered by it, but he loses the ball and it's picked off in midair by the Wolverines. And it looked like David Bowen's coming up with it. I think Bowen's got the ball, but the guy that made the hit, I believe. I believe it might have been Zinkowitz that made the hit. Interesting that they're going to Watson here as opposed to Alston, Joel. I wonder if he, they mentioned that he's been banged up last week. Take a look right in the middle. Pretty good hole right at the end of the play. Right here coming up. No, my, my mistake. It was King, the strong safety. Who gets a piece of that? 17, Clarence Thompson, I believe, Thompson. got his helmet on right. it. You're right. Nice hole. Right there, King is the one that gets knocked off, and you're right, it's Thompson who comes over with the elbow and pops it up, and Bowens is able to make the recovery. So Michigan on the second turnover now by Purdue. Great field position, first and 10. Working into the wind at their own 40-yard line. Greasy's in trouble, and Greasy goes down. 
The sack is there for Leo Perez. We go back to Mike Carrico. Mike? Well, the great college rivalry, Amherst and Williams, this morning on ESPN2 comes down to this. It's the final play of the game. The long pass is intercepted, and it's a scoreless game. So trying to keep a 21-game winning streak alive, the best thing Williams can do is try to lateral the ball. The Stanford Cal play, there was no luck. The game ends in a tie. The win streak for Williams ends at 21. Second and 17 now. Michigan up by three. And a body Schumer on the grass getting back to the original line of scrimmage. Brought down by the free safety Derek Brown. Well, this may not have this may not have done a lot in terms of yardage, but I think it did a lot for Greasy's confidence to finally get the ball out to the wide receiver, Omani Schumer. Schumer lucky just to come up with the ball, and now they come up third and ten. Tough position for the quarterback to be in with the wind in his face and the struggles that he's had here in the first half. The wind continues to whip from the north end of Michigan State into the south end, and the snow is back as well. Third and ten, they're over six of the third down drives it. Here comes the reverse for Mercury Hayes. He's got blockers. He's got a first down. Hayes at the 47 of Purdue, and that was what they were concerned with. They said, you know, Bianca Batuk is going to hammer you for his yards, but the finesse game of Michigan scared Purdue. Well, you know, Joel, they did a great job setting this up. This isn't a really great job of running on the part of Hayes. Take a look at all the bodies. Now, watch, he gets out here, and there's nothing but maize and blue in about two white shirts. Now, stare to the outside. Instead, he actually bumps into his quarterback, Greasy, who's trying to help him downfield. As a result, Hayes gets knocked out a lot sooner than he should have. Cars out of the freeway doing a similar routine right now. <laughs> and the running back, Chris Howard, losing his footing in the backfield and a loss of a couple of yards resulting. He's a sophomore from River Ridge, Louisiana. We put a team three out of the tailback spot for Lloyd Carr today. Well, they're trying to keep their interest. You know, it's kind of tough when you practice all week and don't get an opportunity to get in the game. But evidently, they feel that, uh, that they're really trying to give Bianca Batuga a break. Davis and Howard have seen some snaps today. There's some extensive work already in the first half. Second and 12. Three double blocks. Davis back to the line, the original line. It'll bring up third, 10 0 key for the outside backer. In on that hit. Leads the border makers in tackles. Take a look at the snap here. He almost drops it. Actually, that's a pretty good catch to get it up on the way down. Otherwise, that could have been a disaster. Now, third and 10 will be interesting, Joel, to see what they come up with in terms of bag of tricks. Obviously, the passing attack has struggled with the reverse or flea flicker or something along those lines. You know. so they just finally converted on their first third down on a third and 10. This is also a third and 10. with Schumer, looking for Hayes, and now he's got the boundary. Greasy should be able to get the first down marker, and he doesn't make it. Wow, O'Keefer beat him to the punch. Well, I tell you, that is a great piece of linebacking. They go with the fake reverse, and they've got Hayes as the only guy out there on the route. They want to see Hayes on the post. They fake the reverse. He's the only guy. They have great protection, but they have it covered. Now watch O'Keefer, who's in the middle, come flying across. It looks like Greasy's going to get the first down. As you mentioned, Joel, before, that's a great athletic play. So O'Keefer coming up big, and now another decision. And it looks like Michigan, after deliberating for an extra few seconds, is going to bring other special teams to punt the ball away. And it's going to be Paris Harris once again running, not Nate the long the sophomore who's seen extensive activity as a punter as well. They get all of the dotting, the wide receiver on late. Delay of game. Field position wise, no big deal for the Wolverines. Well, kicking into the wind. I, I, I would say you might be right, except for that 18 yard punt last time. Randy was sure. On the offense, five yard penalty. Our referee today, you can understand the conditions taking their toll on just about everybody. He sounds out of breath. So Michigan leads it by three. Down to the two-minute mark of the opening half. Will they come after Paris Harris after that last punt? No, 
Eagles set up for the return. A little bit better, but not much. Dives into the wind. And they'll come up with it now. First and 10. At their own 26, after only a 17-yard punt. So we do have a timeout on the field for you. Final opportunity in the first half. He can barely see. She can't stand to watch. Welcome back to Ann Arbor. <laughs> real men, real football. Joel Myers, Scott Christensen, Purdue has a 2 0 2 left in the first half. No, continues to gust around the wind to 30, 35 miles an hour. Pressure goes down. They came with the corner blitz, and Thompson got there. Well, ESPN, ESPN2, college hoops ready to go on both. Manhattan, Georgia Tech, DePaul, Michigan, Weaver State, Fresno State, Tark's first game with Fresno State. First round, preseason NIT on ESPN on Wednesday. And don't, don't forget, more NIT on ESPN2, Long Beach State, taking on Arizona. That is Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN2. Only 400 college basketball games on ESPN and ESPN2 this year. We are ready to go. Be right back to Ann Arbor. Michigan with a 3-0 lead. Stop the clock after the sack of the big loss. Todd, why did they go to play action on first down? I was curious. I was curious to see that as well. I would think that they would just run out the clock down three bad field position. I would guess here they're going to run. Only the fifth carry of the half for all Scott. Across the 25 to 26, it'll bring up third and long. By his absence, Allstott has been very noticeable after 36 carries last week, a career best, as Michigan calls another timeout. Stop it with a minute 41 left in the half. He has a bad ankle, a bruised thigh, but as his coaches told us earlier in the week, he played with two broken ankles. Yeah, everybody everybody says the same thing. There was the, the one word that kept coming up with regards to Allstott was throwback. I heard that over and over again where that young man was concerned. I would have been thinking by now that we'd have already been talking about him as the all-time Purdue rusher. Only five carries for 12 yards thus far needing 35 to go past him heading into this game now michigan michigan calls their second timeout and depending upon the punt which has been an absolute adventure today be interesting to see what happens and with the timeout let's take it to mike Tarico. mike Joel, a reminder coming up at the end of this first half, the Office Max Halftime Report. Weather a factor in most of the top 25 games that are going on. We'll have scores and highlights. The Northwestern story, the Wildcats now trail Iowa in their game. And we'll look at the bowl picture in the Big Ten. It's all coming up on the Office Max Halftime Report. See you then. Joel? Okay, Mike. What did you think of Hayden Fry's comments heading into the Northwestern game? I, I thought that interesting after 21 straight victory. Kind of a psychological thing, was it? Did you think? Tough. Tough guy. Tough customer. Third and a dozen. A little more than 11 all in the world. Back at the 25. Dead ball foul coming up against the offense. Minute 40 left in the half. Michigan wants it back. Zatelli, the right guard, may have lifted up early. Well, again, I, I don't understand this. More than likely, your chances of third and 12 are not good. Force them to take their last time out, give all stop the ball and Hot touch. Put 141 on the clock. 141. We're going to ball. Ball start on the offense. Well, Jim Coletto has to be pleased with the respect that his offense has done nothing so far, and he is still only down by three. Yeah, don't don't forget, we mentioned this earlier, this is a team that ran off nearly 400 yards of rushing last week, close to 600 yards in total offense, but this goes to show what a difference that we can make. They now make a third in the long 16, almost 17. Long count by Preston, doesn't get him offside. Goes with the counter. And not much there for Watson. Outstanding play by Stewart. Richard Preston from Saginaw. So now Michigan stops it for a final time in this first half. You're right, Stewart comes across because here, if he's not able to make that tackle, he's going to cut up field and get some extra yardage. Stewart, normally a reserve, is making some great plays today. So now the punting situation, fortunately for Purdue, Degden will have the wind at his back, and it is a good wind at about 25 to 30 miles an hour. Stiff breeze today in Ann Arbor. Don't forget, coming up in just a couple of minutes with Mike Tarico, the office max halftime report. 
Northwestern trailing early in their ball game at home to Iowa. There was snow on the ground. Talked to Chicago this morning. They had about four inches, I believe, out in the suburbs of wet snow. So not exactly the ultimate conditions there. Florida State already up early. And Miami looking solid, looking for their sixth consecutive win. Michael Julian in on all those stories. Have the scores and the highlights as well. What a year it has been for the Big Ten. Four teams currently right now in the top ten. The latest four. Tumor waits inside the 35. The only clean uniform that gets it. A wobbler with the wind in his back. Great for Michigan. Tumor will stay away. Well, actually, as it turned out, it was a break for Purdue. Not only did the roll turn into a longer punt, but that takes some time off the clock. You can see the effect the wind had even when it hit the ground. They rolled for an extra 10, 15 yards. So now it's back outside of the 33 for the Wolverines. This is going to be their seventh possession offensively. The first 30 minutes of play. They're only scoring a 25-yard field goal by Remy Hamilton. But if you join us late, that was on their third series. As Greasy is only three of nine. Real struggle for him to throw the ball today. He's had a couple of receivers open. But on that possession, it was a Craig Allen fumble on a punt by Michigan. And the Wolverines covered it at the two-yard line, but they could not get it to the end zone after they picked up a five-yard penalty on first down, and then it made it first to goal from the seventh. Bryce Boston, starting quarterback for the Wolverines this year, unfortunately suffered ligament damage in his thumb of his throwing hand, and it happened during practice, catching his thumb on the jersey of a teammate. So this season is over, Breezy will go the remainder of the way, and throws it behind as he catches target there. So he wanted Chris Howard, the tailback, just a little bit late. And just a little bit off, for whatever reason. I mean, this, is just, this just isn't that hard of a throw right there, and you're right. It's a little bit behind, certainly a catchable ball, but Greasy would certainly like to have that one back and lead him. The timing continues to be off for Brian Greasy, the sophomore from Columbus High School in Miami. His dad is here, calling the game on a local radio station, in fact. Second and ten. Jim Coletto in his fifth year 
after Duke five years before that head coach Cal State Fullerton looking for his first win against the Wolverines from Michigan his offensive coordinator Tim Salem making those calls let's see if they get away from the play action on second and long don't take that extra time That's what that was. They wanted to delay, catch the ball, get back the yardage that they had lost, but he slipped and fell. Tresker's under a lot of pressure. There's William Carr, the uh, fridge replica, with his specialty. He hasn't been able to get too many away today, has he? No. No, one for three and only two yards. How would you call Marino like number? Gettable very fast so far for the Purdue offensive unit. And now third and 18. Bad snap. That grabs a man. And it's inside the 35 as he finally found Brian Alford, his leading target this year. Well, this is four down territory. It's going to come up fourth and two, and I think they're going to use their timeout and make a decision as to what to do. Well, you can see the snap actually hits him in the butt. Tresker does a good job snapping up and, and through all the conditions. What a tough throw this is. He's got to go over the backer, right in the middle of the field. And after all the struggles that you had just documented about the passing game, he makes a tremendous throw. Yeah, what a thrill for Brian Alford, a young man who grew up in the Detroit suburb of Oak Park, to come up with a big grab. And don't forget, later today, ESPN is a great doubleheader. Auburn, Georgia, the first one at 5 Eastern, followed by Florida and South Carolina. South Carolina at 8 o'clock Eastern. It'll all be followed. Wrap things up. Close out today with the rest of the same college football scoreboard at 11 o'clock. This makes for an interesting decision right now, not just in terms of this play, but the next play. You're saying to yourself, do we have to throw here on fourth and, and kind of a very long one, or can you call two plays? Give it to all of Watson, get the first down and then hustle back up to the line of scrimmage and throw. This puts a lot of pressure on the defense because it isn't a given here. You think that, well, maybe we have to roll out pass or throw a hook pattern, but they don't. If they can get two plays called here, they can get away with the run and come back with the throw. And if they get the first down with the run, as you say, everybody's fairly close to the line still when they right. get the clock stopped for the movement of the chains. And they've got the putter Dickman on the field. Which would really be a shot. No, they're Although they're going to go for a long field goal. Oh. The way that they're back, they're going for a 52-yarder now with Brad Bobbitt. He is 9 of 11 of the year, the senior from Greenfield, Indiana. It'll be a 52-yard attempt out of the hole for Potter Dexter. Man, I am really surprised with this. I know he's 9 of 11, but... Uh, Big change is good. The low line drive ball could be close, though. So now Michigan gets it back with 30 seconds left on the clock. You know, the reason I don't like that, besides the fact that they missed the field goal, what does that say about the confidence in your offense, Joel? I mean, it's kind of a subtle thing to the quarterback and the rest of the people. Hey, it's fourth and a long one, 30-some seconds left. Certainly we can get a little bit closer. That kick didn't have a chance. Remember, Remy Hamilton, a career 82% kicker, who does have the leg for a 50-yarder, wasn't even close earlier. Everything's fine in terms of the hold and, and everything else, but the footing's not as good. The elements are just not conducive to making that kind of kick. But how do you really feel about the call, Todd? <laughs> well, I just, I don't understand it. I'm just telling you, as a former offensive player, when you get in that situation, you're saying, come on, give us a chance, give us a chance. What are the chances of making a 52-yard field goal? Slim and none. So the one snap, the knee, and now the officials are going to say that that will be the final play of the first snap. So, tough conditions to play football and anything else as we head back to the studio. Michigan by three, and let's head back now to Mike Tureen. All right, Joel, so special teams, a big factor. Uh, the kicking game all over the country, not just this game, all fouled up, as you will see during our halftime report. The Wolverines lead by three. Coming up here on the Office Max Halftime Report, complete scores and highlights from all the games going on in college football. We'll take you to Evanston where it has been a tough 24 hours weather-wise. Earlier today, this is the scene where college game day was supposed to come from, but Chris Lee and Craig 
and company have moved inside. We'll get everyone's thoughts on the game at Northwestern as well. At the break in the big house, Michigan leads by three. Don't touch the remote. This halftime report is brought to you by Office Max. Now it's Michigan in the snow and rain, 3-0. That's the scene in Alabama for the Alabama-Mississippi State game. Bobby Bowden and the Seminoles dealing with inclement weather in Chapel Hill for their game against North Carolina. And you've seen our game in the muck, in the wet. And we all need to towel off after that first half. Michigan by three as we welcome you to the Office Max Halftime Report. This front that came through the Midwest now heading through the south and northeast uh, dropped some snow on Evanston last night. No snow really during the game for Iowa and Northwest in the series as we chronicled in game day, dominated by the Hawkeyes. Would they be the team that gets in the way of Northwestern's dream season? Early on, Eric Hilgenberg, the Iowa defensive end, taken off the field with a knee injury. So the Iowa defense will undermanned undermanned for trying to stop Darnell Autry and company. Schnurr goes up to the air. Perfect throw, but Dwayne Spate can't hold on in the end zone. Fourth down, Wildcats go for a 50-yard field goal. It is good. The Northwestern on the go and field goal at 3-0. But back comes Iowa. A Cedric Shaw-led running drive for a score. Made it 7-3. Then on the ensuing possession, Schnurr, the fullback cartel, tips it, intercepted by Tom Knight. Tom Knight takes it the distance, and Iowa scores back-to-back -to -back touchdowns to make it 14-3. But Northwestern takes it back down the field. Schnurr to Darren Drexler, up the middle. Is he going to get in? Touchdown, Northwestern. They've just kicked the point. The Northwestern trails Iowa by four. 8.25 left second quarter. Iowa looking for 22 straight in this series. To Florida State, of course, they lost their last game against Virginia on the road in Chapel Hill after North Carolina goes three and out. The punt is blocked. Mario Edwards picks it up, takes it in. 7 nothing Knowles. Here's their first offensive play of the game. Warwick Dunn, denied last time he touched the ball against Virginia, not denied here. 43-yard touchdown for Dunn. He has just run in another one, sandwiched in between that, a North Carolina touchdown by Mike Thomas. The extra point was missed, so the Seminoles lead in Chapel Hill in the rain by 15. Also in the ACC, co-leader Virginia in College Park. Maryland's up 3-0 on the ensuing kickoff. Hey, you got to touch the ball. Paul Jackson recovers for Maryland. It leads four plays later to this. Turf quarterback Scott Milanovic, who really snapped out of the slump last week, runs it in on the boot from one yard out. They go for two and make it up 11-0. Back comes Virginia, though. They add a field goal, and then a Tiki bar Barber two-yard run. Capping off an eight-play 47-yard drive, so the odd score, Virginia and Maryland, tied at 11 in College Park in the second. Also in the conference, Clemson, which has been red hot, leading by the score of 7-0 over Duke. Emmett Smith's brother in the house again for a touchdown. We showed you the rain going on in Tuscaloosa, a factor for Alabama early. Wet ball, bad snap. The punter Hayden Stockton just takes it out of the end zone. Safety for Mississippi State, they're up 2-0. Then, it's Coach Shaw and team. Mississippi State drives it down the field. Derek Tate to Eric Moles, a four-yard touchdown. Jackie Sherrill, the Mississippi State coach, has never beaten his alma mater, Alabama, right now, leading by nine halfway through the second quarter there. This was Temple's home game, but they moved it to RFK Stadium in Washington in hopes of getting some fans. It's a Virginia Tech-dominated crowd. The Hokies lead by three. Syracuse, which lost at Blacksburg last week, putting it on Pittsburgh early 28-7. Rob Conrad, their freshman running back, has two touchdown runs. Perfect first half for their quarterback, Donovan McNabb. More on the games we've just showed you the scores of. Back to Evanston, Chris, Lee, and Craig. Mike, thank you. A lot to talk about. Let's start with the game here. A very important answering drive. We showed you the touchdown. The Northwestern scored to make it 14-10. It was set up by a personal foul penalty on Iowa on the kickoff, so a mistake. And then Northwestern, another one of those impressive answering drives. But Iowa so far getting a better push up front than the Wildcats. Well, you know, I've been watching the field out there. It's frozen. I, Darnell Archer, who is from Florida, had problems at the beginning of the game hitting up there. I didn't think he hit it up there with as much authority as he had in the past. He's getting better now. I think it'll help him, but you got a reason why he didn't play well at the beginning. Absolutely. Cedric Shaw is outperforming because he had more carries. You know, we sit there and we watch. It's cold, man. I'm telling you, my ears are falling off. I can't even look at it. 
Cedric Shaw with 20 carries, his blood, his blood gets thrown in the body. He's moving out there, whereas Darnell Autry, up until this last series, just wasn't quite into the game. That'll help him a lot. Florida State, how are the Seminoles rebound after some time to think about that loss at Virginia? Well, the turnover troubles continue. They had a backward lateral that turned into a turnover and a free six points, but up front, the Knowles are playing well. Well, Florida State did an analysis of themselves. They threw the ball too much last week against Virginia. They've gone back to a more of a balanced offense. In fact, in the second quarter, they had only thrown four passes. They're running the ball to get much better balance. Watch them come out and start throwing the ball a lot in the second half. Meanwhile, against Virginia, Scott Milanovic once again efficient for the second consecutive week. George Welch a little bit worried his team had too much time to bask in the big upset of Florida State. They did not play well early. No, they didn't, but that's key there. It's early they didn't play well, but they're coming back. If you get Tiki Barber in the game, running the ball and controlling the ground game, that'll open it up for them. Virginia will win the game, but they started so probably because of their mindset. They do need to worry about Scott Milanovic getting hot, though. Talking about looking ahead, Alabama, of course, yep. the big war with Auburn. Mississippi State, the worst defense in the SEC. But Alabama giving them the gifts with special teams miscues. Very uncharacteristic stuff. Well, Mississippi State's lead 9-0. This is an interesting sidebar in this situation. Jackson Sherrill, the Mississippi State coach, got his house up for sale. Now, I don't know. For tax purposes, I know for sure it's better to own than rent. I don't know how long <laughs> you're going to be there, right? You hardly ever bought a house. I know. I got a house. <laughs> Elsewhere in the Big Ben, Michigan and Purdue, the bad weather that was here last night, early this morning, moving east, not that cold, but the sloppy track for the Wolverines, nobody can get anything going. And i tell you what you have to worry about there, the team that has to go out and throw the ball, because of those poor conditions, risks the chance of having a big-time miscue. Only thing that needs to happen in this game is one mistake and the other team takes over. If it's Purdue that takes over, Mike Offside on the ground to be the guy. You're right, that weather can be a big equalizer. Purdue, they need a lot of equalizers in most games this year. Yeah. Coming up, we'll talk about the bowl picture in the Big Ten, still very much up in the air. But when we continue at halftime, Mike Tirico, more scores and highlights in the Big East. Miami trying to get a piece of that championship and a major bowl visit, visiting the Eagles. I like that. Coming up. is presented by Office Max. Take your business to the max. Office Max. 186 of total yards in the first half. Michigan leads Purdue by three. For Miami, this is their final road game today. They've won five in a row and with two more in the Orange Bowl against Syracuse and West Virginia, the Canes could be on a very hot roll heading to a potential bowl game. Taking on Boston College in Massachusetts, Miami's first possession, Ryan Clement rushed. Goes deep though, Gerard Gaffin is the backup tight end. Over the shoulder grab, 56 yard score. Canes up 7 0 and getting it done on defense. Mark Hartzell can't find anyone open. Kennard Lang comes in, gets the sack. It was 7 0 at that point, it's 7 0 now at halftime. Dan McGuire has missed 41 and 30 yard field goals for the Eagles. Great early start from Michigan State, leading in Bloomington by 14. Scott Green, the latest score, a 76-yard punt return. Back to the ACC, where Georgia Tech is trying to stay above 500. A field goal game. They lead North Carolina State by three. Cincinnati and Kentucky. A little border war here. Kentucky trying to snap out of a three-game slide, leading by six. Last Southwest Conference game at Jones Stadium. Texas Tech and TCU all even at three. And Ball State playing its final game of the season. The only team to beat Central Michigan last year has a 14-0 lead on the Chippewas this afternoon. Bowling Green ending a disappointing season. Their final regular season game up 11 at Dick Stadium against Kent. And Ohio on the board with an early safety. Leading by two over Miami of Ohio, Miami's second place in the match. Coming up on ESPN2, all the scores and highlights later tonight at 6 Eastern. It's Stuart Scott and Kenny Main with Sports Night, the College Football Edition. Next, get you ready for Big Ten football from the Metrodome, Wisconsin. Really in a must-win situation for their bowl hopes against Jim Wacker's Golden Gophers. That's coming up at 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Speaking of bowls, we're going to talk about the Big Ten, the bowl picture, and get you updated on Northwestern. The score has changed in Evanston. All that is the Office Max Halftime Report continues. This is the Office Max Halftime Report. Michigan leads 3-0 in our game. In Evanston, remember Northwestern trying to claw back now from an 11-point deficit. Brian Musso picks up the bouncing punt, gets past the Hawkeyes, and he's gone. A 60-yard punt return for touchdown. 
14 points in 99 seconds. Northwestern, just like that, from down 11 to up 3. They lead Iowa by the score of 17-14. Of course, Northwestern, a part of the Big Ten Bowl picture. Let's talk about that with Chris, Lee, and Chris. Uh, thank you, Mike. Yeah, Brian Musso, the son of Johnny Musso, the great Alabama running back who played some football here in town for the Bears. Barnett said he's the best he's ever seen at handling punts, so that has Northwestern up by a field goal, and that, of course, impacts the bowl situation. We're going to do some projections here and see how the Big Ten bowl breakdown will look. Now, you have Ohio State. They have to, of course, win out. They have the tiebreaker over Northwestern because of the better overall record if they end up tied. So Northwestern would have the second choice to sit this bowl. Would love to have the Wildcats take on Tennessee down there. The Outback has the third choice. Michigan and Penn State still have to battle to find out who's going to be third and fourth in the conference. Iowa needs two more victories to become bowl eligible. Michigan State, you saw leading Indiana. They need another victory to become bowl eligible. Wisconsin and Purdue have to win out to even get in that bowl picture with the six wins against 1A team. So it's still a lot to be settled. Well, Chris, I love the Rose Bowl's tiebreaker rule, though. And the other teams in the country, including the associate uh, ACC and the Big East, ought to follow this. The rule is this, head-to-head -head, and then best overall record. To me, that's the best situation to decide who should go to the Rose Bowl and these other bowls. Head-to-head -head is the best situation. Yeah, sure. Right now, Ohio State and Northwestern, they're not going to play each other. And that's why there's a lot of conversation this year, or this particular time of the year, about them having a round-robin tournament again, where all the teams have to play each other. The problem with that, some coaches want to go outside of the Big Ten so they can have big-time games with other opponents. They don't want to be locked into the Big Ten in this region. But the bottom line, you need to do it on the field, I would think, as a coach and as a player. So you like the head-to-head, -head, which would give Virginia yeah. take the edge over, say, in Miami, or yeah. Virginia over Florida State. Yeah, head-to-head. Okay. -head. Virginia's losing. Now to the big ball game this afternoon in Columbus, and the bad weather, of course, we told you, has moved. It'll be a sloppy track. Illinois, a big underdog with that good defense. Does it help them out? Uh, well, it takes away what it does is from the fact that Terry Glenn's hurt. So what? Now you go with Eddie George. Bad weather conditions, we've seen it all over the north right now. You've got to have a good ground game to stay in it. Eddie George will be the key guy. He gets his chance to shine as a Heisman man. Important point from a coach's standpoint. If Terry Glenn plays, you can't double cover the split inside. You've got to keep coverage on him. That leaves the tight end and the split end open for passes. If he doesn't play, you roll the coverage and stop those other two guys. He's as good as a decoy as he is a player. Simeon Rice has not had a sack the last three games. That hurt the pass rush. That's conventional wisdom on a sloppy track going against Orlando Pace. That great line for the Put him on the outside like you've been talking about. Just boom, keep George inside. Just about every soul here in Evanston will be watching that game on ABC later on this afternoon. Provided the Wildcats, of course, can hold on to the lead over Iowa. Coming up, Mike Tirico, more scores and highlights. And the second half is ahead of Ann Arbor. Sloppy track. It's the Wolverines and the Boilermakers. Oh, the snowflakes starting to fly. We're back on the office, Matt Castine Report. Before we get you back to Ann Arbor, a great college rivalry today on ESPN2. Amherst and Williams. This is the final play of the game. It's scoreless in the fourth quarter. The Amherst quarterback, Rick Willard, intercepted. And now Williams trying to keep alive a 21-game winning streak. Well, boy, it's a good thing that a kid from Amherst wasn't there to intercept that attempted lateral. The game ends in a scoreless tie, snapping the 21-game win streak. This game had 19 punts for a scoreless tie in this great rivalry since 1906. Back to Division One. Let's get you updated on some scores. That Warwick done second touchdown. They're now at halftime. The Seminoles lead by 15. Virginia and Maryland. Late stages second quarter. All even at 11. A Maryland drive was just thwarted. Clemson and Duke remains 7-0 as Clemson looks to make it four straight wins. That game's in Death Valley. Alabama, we can update this game. The Crimson Tide have scored. Dennis Riddle, he scored the touchdown to beat Mississippi State last year. Seven-yard touchdown here. The Mississippi State lead is two. Freddie Kitchens, the starting quarterback in this game for the top. Temple is leading Virginia Tech 6-3. This game being played at RFK in Washington. Tech has won seven straight games. A wild game in Bloomington. Michigan State and Indiana have added two more touchdowns. A second special team score for the Spartans. They lead by 14. The rest of the day on ESPN looks like this. In prime time, an SEC doubleheader. Auburn between the hedges for Georgia and then Florida at South Carolina at 8 Eastern. And, time permitting after the game, the residents in Scorpion. Second half in Ann Arbor, coming up. Welcome back once again to 
Whitney and Shelly, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Joel Islow and Todd Christensen. The win definitely a huge factor, especially in the second half of a tight game. And Todd, you don't see a team defer their option to the second half to give up the ball to start the second half and give it away twice to start the game. But that looks like what the situation is going to be for the University of Michigan. They let Purdue, and they deferred for their option to the second half. They let Purdue have the ball to start the game, and they're going to do the same for the second half because of the win. Well, I would think that the statistics right here would reveal that this isn't exactly what you call an offensive juggernaut. You can see that Purdue has, has compiled 50 total yards, and Michigan only 136. So, needless to say, it's a defensive contest. It's going to be won by either a mistake in the kicking game, a fumble, a turnover, something of that nature. And obviously, Michigan's defense has been so fantastic in the first half. That's the way they want to start it again. And so, Purdue has their work cut out for them this quarter. With, as they've struggled offensively, now they must do it into the win. So the Buttermakers sending back once again on the kickoff return, Lee Johnson. Jim Coletta, the head coach, I'm looking at, you know what, Joel, I, I just really don't like that decision at the end of the half. Even if they go for it and don't get it, at least you've got a little confidence psychologically with your offense. Right now, you only have 50 yards in total offense. It's not just the fact that you're struggling in the literal sense, but in the subconscious, you're saying to yourself, well, we're not even sure if we can get two yards in a crucial situation, and that doesn't bode well. Not exactly a pick-me-up in the offensive unit. Joe Hagans going back with Lee Johnson. Back at the five-yard line for the Boilermakers. Feely, the place kicker for Purdue. Jay Feely's going to need help once again, so holding the ball for Michigan. It's going to be Steve King, the free safety. So Michigan is going to kick it away. The way to the back of the place kicker doesn't need much on this knuckle ball, though. And Lee Johnson will kick it from the eight. And Johnson with a solid return across the 25 gives the Boilermakers the first down at the 27. It's a little interesting that Purdue is going to have the wind at their back in the fourth quarter, which as it turns out that Michigan didn't elect to kick it the other way and take the win for the final 15 minutes of play. Yeah, it is, good. it is going to be interesting. Take a look at the comparison between the two. Allstott has been a non-factor in the first half. The Akabatuka nearly 100 yards already. That one scintillating 37-yard run down the sideline. The bulk of that yard. surprise you a little bit? Uh, the Akabatuka's numbers, no. Allstott, yes. Yeah, really good. I thought he'd have bigger numbers. 27 is the first down. All stop. Breaking the initial tackle of the backfield for a yard to 28. Sam Sword. Well, the first one in to wrap him up. You know, I, I am surprised, though, that they're not taking the win for the fourth quarter, but here in the third quarter. Well, the, what, the, what the theory behind this is the way they started the game, which was three and out. And if the punter can only get one, send a midfield of the 45, Bianca Batuka takes off a couple of chunks, and they can punch in the end zone. Ten nothing on a day like this could, could be insurmountable. The way that that is not just looking at the flag, it's bending the poles to the city upright, doing the same for the big flag pole. Next to the upright, at the down bend, second and eight. They have all shot a couple on first down. Treacherous footing. You can see a little ginger off the gingerly on his footing as he gets a couple of more up to the 30. And we head back to the studio now with Mike Tarico, Mike. And we send you on this McDonald's breakaway to Evanston, Northwestern. We showed you the punt return by Muto. Up three. Back comes Iowa. Max Sherman. 39 yards. A foot race and some upper body strength that Scott Slutsker wins. Iowa up three at the half. situation into the win. Boy, that's a tough throw. Tresker does a great job. He does a tremendous job. It's just going to be a basic hook pattern right right here at the bottom. He's going to come across, just settle down. Tough throw into the win. Now he's going to get the helmet on the ball. 
off that hustling behind is able to get the fumble. You know, they're always talking about the fact that this is a throwback guy, somebody who does not quit, who gives his all in every play. He certainly could have been loafing there and not been there. Instead, he's hustling behind the play, prevents the turnover. First and 10. That's the first time they've been thrown on a third down today. Dresser with time. And he's got a receiver picked up by Woodson. Woodson inside the 40 on the interception. And the true freshman from Fremont, Ohio, has his third interception of the season. And he got and the head coach, Jim Collette, is the one that got hit in the eye there at the end of the play. I hope he's all right. But that's a great play by Woodson. Two factors. Two factors as to why he was able to pick that ball up. One, certainly the wind slows down the velocity of the football. And the second thing, he's a left-hander rolling right. Take a look. at Remember, this is the play that earlier he had run for 13 yards so effectively. Now he, he has the same situation. The man appears open, but Woodson, you can see the ball slowing down going into the wind. Woodson able to pick it off. Gets knocked out of bounds right into the coach. Take a look at the foot. Ooh, look at that. Foot came up. Foot came up and caught him in the eye. We'll give you an update. Hopefully, Jim Coletto is okay on the Purdue bench. Be right back to Ann Arbor. They've been working feverishly in the corner of Jim Coletto to close that little mouse under his eye. Fortunately, he is okay. Look at the end of the play. You can see Woodson's cleat come up. Watch it catches him right in the eye. Now watch his reaction. You can see he's going to grab his eye. He's obviously in, obviously in a fair amount of pain. Chris Floyd, the single set, takes it on first down for the Wolverines. He gets three, almost four. That was a rarity. You don't often see the fullback make the catch. He gets, you know, he's very upset. You wonder if it's because he's in pain or because of the interception. Actually, did you, did you saw earlier they put a band-aid on it, Joel, and he just ripped it right off. But no, no. I'm tough. I can't look at it. He's a tough customer. Second and six down. Outside of the 33. So we want to get back to Ann Arbor after the pick. But the quarterback, Woodson, great field position for the territory. For the Wolverines. And a bobble by the running back, Chris Howard, loses a couple, almost three yards, back to the 36. And we remind you, ESPN presentation of college football is being brought to you this afternoon by Saab, who invites you to find your own road. Now, you talk about a true home field advantage. New Jersey at halftime for the Michigan Wolverines, so they get the soggy wet ones off. Purdue does not have that good one. And that is a factor that you go in at halftime and it's wet and cold. That doesn't warm up. You can the heaters all you want. They're denied. Play action for Greasy. Try to find his footing. Poked away by the linebacker O'Connor as they wanted Mercury Hayes. So the nice deep drop by the middle linebacker and Bob O'Connor and the coaches told us the heartbeat of this squad. And he does a great job, but the thing is that they've only got two guys out in the pattern. You can see both tight ends stay in to block. Look at all the white shirts. Now as he throws them in, look. One, two, three, four, five white shirts and only two black shirts, May shirts, or blue shirts rather, hello. Actually, it's six, six white shirts and only two blue shirts. Buttermakers are worried about a flag deep in the secondary, though. Good ball, ball. First throw. Find the defense. Now, shoot. Now, to the fourth down, the play was over. We will penalize it. It will be first down for two. And it was actually third long. Third and nine but they penalized Purdue, and what a huge break for the Wolverines. Well, there's a big argument in the secondary. You can see now off the side is Garrett Brown, the free safety. He's the one that's been putting, on some, serious, putting some serious hits on some people. I wonder if he's ejected, Joel. So now they take it down to the 21. First down, Michigan to keep the drive alive. Otherwise, a coming situation on fourth and nine. Not the Akapatuka, but Davis for his three, almost four. Brought down by Aaron Hall, the outside linebacker. They have to wonder what the situation is with the Akapatuka because you had, Joey had to figure that halftime he had plenty of time to rest, comes out in the first series, and they had two different tailbacks, both reserve tailbacks starting. I wonder if he's banged up a little bit. 
Sox for his spotting team. That's I see your admission because he said he was a little bit nicked up, and that's probably why they didn't use him around the goal line, and they used Ed Davis. That second situation where they had first and goal. But now seven and seven. Call of the 18. Davis again. Not much available on the left side. Waddell quickly over there with Kirk the co-captain. Of the Big Ten scores. As well as ACC. You know, if you've got, if you're the de defensive member of this Purdue team, you got to be saying, please, offense, you got to do something. They've been spending, it seems like, you know, the entire game, the entire game on the field get beat up by that big offensive line of Michigan. And yet at this point, they're still hanging tough. Well, a couple of first downs in the first half of Purdue. You're right, that defense has been out there a lot. Here comes Terry Long. Greasy in trouble. Can he run for the first down? No, he will not get there unless he gets a real favorable spot. He was put down at the 12. Bill Barker just inside the 12. Paul caught up with him. The outside backer once again and another co-captain. He's been having a big game today. Not just the interception, but the big tackles that he has made. Number 39 for Purdue has been outstanding. Bob Greasy with the hat on, watching his son, Brian. Got a fourth down situation. They're going to go for it. So the former Boilermaker, it's an unusual situation, working in a Wolverine radio broadcast. Fourth and less than a yard. Carr is the fullback. That's a big defensive lineman there at fullback, Joel. And it's going to be Carr chained for the first down inside the 11. Now i got to tell you, that it, it may not seem like a big deal because you've seen that happen a lot of times with running backs. But that's a 275, 280-pound man who was able to make a very athletic play in singing off and getting it. Take a look in the middle. He's going he's gonna to collide, and you figure that that's all he's in there for is just to run straight ahead. But he runs at the back of the center, spins, and makes the 360 and gets the first down. If he does not make the spin, it's for new football. Did he leave earlier, or is that just me? He's, he's trying to show off his quickness. In the, in the film, he'll be able to tell everybody, I'm the quickest of the three back. Ed Davis, is just going to set in a two-side end formation. And he just follows that big wall in front of him down to the six-yard line for a gain of close to five. Washell finally getting to the running back. But not much of a hold, just the surge. Well, the indication here, Joel, is, as I mentioned earlier, is that has got to be getting a little bit confused. Cold day, wet day to be out there that long, and they were on the field for most of the first half. Just about six minutes gone by in the third quarter, a three to nothing lead for Michigan. They can pick up a first down just inside the one. And the Akabatuka stays on the sideline, and Davis stays in the backfield. And Greasy drops it and finally covers it back near the nine. He had that problems all day long coming away from the center with the ball. Didn't see this kind of weather playing for Columbus High School in Miami. Did no, no, not at all. See if he comes back a little bit early. He didn't. He just didn't get the snap. And actually, he's able, he's lucky to get it at all because he's colliding there with his lineman. by the defensive unit. And Jamie Washell is just having an outstanding football game at defensive tackle. Look at that. He's the double team right in the middle. He fights off both the center and the guard and outruns the quarterback. He's able to get the greasy. Great effort on the part of number 51, Jamie Washell. And now 34 yard field goal drive. Coming out for Rennie Hamilton. The holder really important for positions like they are today. Reverse for the tight end. And don't forget last time it was blocked. Into this one and pulls it wide left. So once again, they come away empty deep in Purdue territory. Don't capitalize on the wood two pick. And it's still the Boilermakers down by only three. Well, 
well. The Purdue players can definitely draw inspiration from their head coach. One of the trainers tried to put a band-aid on Jim Coletto. Almost had a blazing battle. We don't need these big band-aids. <laughs> First and 10, Boilermakers at their own 20. All shot, waiting for a hole to develop. It was never there. And that's been the story. For all shot all day long, Irons the first one over there. The hold is okay. I prefer the one finger hold because of the compression of the ball. But watch the left foot of Hamilton. Watch it skid just a little as it plans. See as it skids a little bit and he's just a little bit off. That's what caused him to hook it. Tough day for Remy Hamilton. Came in 14 of 18 on the season. Strong numbers. He's only one of four today. And coming into the, and coming into today had a career of 82 percent outstanding for the All American last year. Chapter with some time, trying to go underneath the tight end Blackman, but incomplete. Seven consecutive games, Michigan Stadium has had better than 100,000 people in the stands. To give you an idea of how tough these weather conditions are, I don't know if we have 50, 55,000 on hand today. Third and 10, back in the border makers 20. All shot. Again, good penetration to the backfield. Coming up, David Bowen. He didn't make the stop, but he's definitely slowed him down. Well, of course, Jared Irons is in on the play as well. What Purdue tried to do there was spread some people out. They flexed, they flexed Watson out at a flanker, but it didn't fool number 37, Jared Irons. And I'm surprised you haven't brought this up, Joel. Yes, yes, I did play with his dad, Gerald. So you know, great, great linebacker, number 86 for the Oakland Raiders, and later with the Cleveland Browns, his son following in his footsteps. I tell you what, boy, his, his dad, Gerald, had some guns on him. I mean, he had some biceps, guys. I mean, he was, he was put together. Degnan made the punt once again into the busiest water maker. Another three and out for new offense. Monty Cooper waits. And another knuckleball. So, Michigan's going to have great field position. We'll spot it at the 37. Coletto can't believe it. A 15-yard punt. Sunday night, NFL on ESPN. John Elway of the Denver Broncos. 5-4 mark against the 5-4 Philadelphia Eagles. Shannon Sharp, one of the best in the game. Ricky Waters leading the Eagles offensive unit. Join us, 8 o'clock Eastern, Sunday night, the NFL on ESPN. My kind of guy. <laughs> is it just me? Or is it just me or is it Dallas? Dallas 8-1 and the rest of the league 5-4. Feels that way, doesn't it, a little bit? A strange year in the NFL. Yeah, it is. It really is. Seems to be about six or eight teams, and then a huge drop-off for the rest of the NFL. On first down, Greasy jumping and Silver waiting for the block. Almost got the big kick out block from the center, Rod Payne. Billy takes it down to the 28, and that's a big play in a game where there have been very few plays of more than seven, eight yards. Bianca Batuka, we understand, has a calf strain. They think he may be able to return, but right now, it's back by committee, and Clarence Williams is in there. This is, a, this is a great play for a lot of reasons. One, they haven't done it. It gets the ball in Toomer's hand, so he doesn't get discouraged. It's a very safe pass to reestablish Reese's confidence. So now, second and short. How often we said that today for either team? Second and a yard. The new back, you can tell, he's got a real clean jersey. Clarence Williams, a true freshman out of Cass Tech in Detroit. Picks up the first down inside the 27 to the 26. Brought down by Bob O'Connor. Well, if nothing else, Bianca Batuka has got to be feeling good about the fact that it's taken now, what, four or five different guys to replace him. I mean, they've been throwing in all sorts of fresh bodies. Frustration has got to set in, though, if Michigan can come away with points. Second consecutive drive in this half. They started with the Purdue 37. Yeah, the odds have to be in the favor of Fresker and Purdue to at least get something mounted. And the way things are going, if they get one drive mounted and stick it in the end zone, well, they'd be up. Williams getting the call, weaving his way nicely up the middle. Down inside the 25, close to the 21. And Washell wrapped up the running back. 
Well, you know what? They say he may be back. I'm sorry, I don't see it. I mean, if the guy's got if the guy's got the jacket on right here with his team on offense, only up three nothing, and he's not out there. I don't like his chance to get back in the game. So essentially, you're saying he's got everything but the pads on. <laughs> but that's the football thing. You still keep your pads on because you're a part of the group. I never understood that. 415 in county, Michigan by three. Greasy looking on the quick out, turned in for Tuber. And he can't hang on. Not a pass throw at all, though, by Ryan Greasy. Don't forget, coming up later, Todd and I will be selecting the Kelly Springfield players of the game. Special teams definitely could determine the outcome of this one. So now big third down for Greasy in the offensive unit. Third and six. Haven't had a lot of success on third down so far today. It's only one of 11. Third down today. To the left. Big hole for Johnson. He's got the first down of the 15. And check that Clarence Williams with the first down run right down by Bob O'Connor. That's a good call. It's a good call. They've been ineffective throwing the ball. Come back with the draw. Look at the offensive line of Michigan creating a big gap in the middle. O'Connor falls off to make the tackle, but not before he gets the first down. Good call by Fred Jackson. Right in the middle. Again, for the Wolverines, and they finally capitalized on the great field position, though. Williams fell into the backfield. Craig Williams got in early to right end. Williams carried. He's a senior. It's almost like Glenn Ellen, Illinois. <laughs> you know what? It's almost like Pavlov's dog here, Joel. I mean, they give up the yardage, and all of a sudden they get inside the 10, and Purdue gets overly aggressive and anticipates what's happening. Comes the top of your screen. Look at that. You're right. Boy, he fought off Runyon, and Runyon, potential All-American candidate, and from what I hear, a lot of people seem to feel like this is the left tackle that could be in the first two rounds of the draft. Definitely. Pete Runyon with an inside move there. So now, second and chance back at the 15. Plenty of time for Greasy. Mercury Hayes underneath. Finds Lake Michigan. <laughs> And look, he was doing the butterfly. That was funny. Bob O'Connor did an outstanding job of bumping him as he came across the field. Hayes runs the hook. Watch the middle of your field. Watch number 66. He's going to bump Hayes, but he can't run with him. Obviously, he's not called Mercury for nothing, and he's able to run away. Now as O'Connor and Hall knock him out of bounds, splash. I give it a 5-2. We won't call you the Russian judge. I like it better than that. Third and long now. Third and seven from the 12. The delay. Good move. Can he get there? Touchdown, Michigan and Clarence Williams. But there is a flag at the offensive line. line. The one goes the border maker's way. Penalty is going to be marked off against the Wolverines and deny them that touchdown. Awesome. Well, you knew that one right away, Joel, simply because it was the referee, not the umpire, that threw the flag. It's interesting because Bri Bri Brian Greasy, Brian Greasy tried to debate. Watch right here. Take a look at the grab. He's got a hold of him. I watch he tries to come up right there when he can't get his right arm out and he gets the takedown. That's what the official sees. Watch him try to get the right arm out. It doesn't come out, and as a result, that's what the officials see. Zach Adamy is the one who gets called for the hold. Other scores in college football today. Well, Michigan could die. Can they come up big on a third and 17? About three minutes left of the third quarter. Don't forget they get the winter back to this 15 minutes of play. Silver on the lateral pass. Looking for Hayes, puts it up for grabs, and it's intercepted. Picked off by Jamel Coleman. So the Razzle Dazzle doesn't fool the Boilermakers. Not only didn't fool the Boilermakers, they had two different people that could have picked that off. Yeah, I really hate that play, and here's why. You've got a situation to where you're not going to get the first down anyway. Get enough to where you can get a field goal. 
Mr. Duke comes up big defensively once again. They get it back at their own 20. Jamel Coleman coming up with a big play. The interception for the Boilermakers, but a bad break for Purdue when initially they looked like they were going to put it to the 20. The Boilermakers get it now to three. Well, here's the other thing, too. If Jamel Coleman can just let it go, and of course you don't want to just let an interception go, but someone else would have picked it off. In this case, it would have been Derek Brown who would have picked it off and had some momentum going the other direction. Instead, now they're stuck at the three. And also barely gets past the three, possibly to the four, and that is all. Chilly it is this afternoon. We got up to the ballpark. It was just raining. It was about 50 degrees. Now it's down to 32, and because of the wind, which is gusting upwards of 30 to 35 miles an hour, the wind chill, a very comfortable eight below. Three to nothing, Michigan. 222. Deuces wild left in the third quarter. And yet, there you see Jamel in the short sleeve. Didn't face him any. Tough guy. Tough guy. He didn't find like Michigan on the, on the Michigan sideline. Second and nine now from the four. The new back loses his footing. That was Kevin Sellers, our check back. It's Kendall Matthews. Yeah, for the first time today, carried the ball. And you know what? Had he not stumbled, nobody touched him. He'd have had some yardage. Fresh legs. He's listed as a reserve tight end. He's working out of the backfield on that play. So now third and nine. The wind in the face of the border makers as you're thinking about a possible pass. Ball shot onto the leg and a punting situation. Coming up for the border makers. Same time today, they have gone three and out with a punch. And don't forget that Degnan's last punt was only 15 yards. The cheers are for the Michigan defense, which has been outstanding. But then again, in fairness to them, no more outstanding than Purdue's, which has been under much more duress. Seventh punch coming up for Rob Dakin. Silver standing just inside the 40. Good play by Jenkins to get up and get it. And you see the wind knock it down, just like a wedge shot into the wind. It stops. And now, it's out of bounds of the 26. Michigan's got great field position. We check in with Mike Tirico. Mike? Wow, Joel. Just rain in Chapel Hill. Florida State's offense quiet for the first part of the third quarter. Now gets it done. Get out to Andre Cooper. Cooper's 12th TV reception of the year. One away from the school's single season record. Knowles by 22. It looked too easy, Mike. They'll just rain there and just sleep here in Ann Arbor. 32 seconds left in the third quarter. Don't forget, though, Purdue, if they can hold them here, it's the tall order with the way their defense has been out there for most of the third quarter and most of the first half, in fact. Only a couple of first downs for the first half for the Boilermakers offensively. They will have to whip their back to the final 15 minutes of play. For the lane. French leg to Clarence Williams bouncing around inside the 25, down to the 22 for a pickup of close to four. How many more times? You get in that huddle if you're Purdue. You say, how many more times can we do this? Can we hang on? And as you pointed out, Joel, if they continue to do it, if they can just hang in there, even force them again to kick a field goal, good or bad, still one score away. And the knock, of course, coming into the contest, uh, at least before the Wisconsin game, Purdue would have a much better record if their defense just came through this year. Well, their defense has definitely held up their end of the agreement so far today after three. It's back by committee for the fourth quarter for the Wolverines in Michigan as Tim Diakopatuka out with a calf strain. So right now, Chris Howard is the tailback in Greece. He's throwing on second and six. Going underneath for Remersma, who is belted by the linebacker Aaron Hall. Hall has played an outstanding game sideline to sideline. Yeah, it really has, and done it, and done it on both, both ends, both in pass coverage and run support. As you mentioned, he had to make the move over the weak side backer spot. That time he picks up the tight end, he was sliding across, but he definitely made a transition to the move for the good of the team. Big difference where Michigan has started with.
with the ball for Purdue in the second half. Drive charge is 26, third three now for the Wolverines. Reese had the man the flat and still gets the first down underneath the Mercury Hayes of the 14. Follow Connors making the stop, but not before Mercury Hayes comes up with a big third down conversion. You got to give a lot of credit to the offensive line of Michigan. They gave Reese plenty of time. Watch the right of your screen as he comes in. Mercury Hayes runs a swirl. Now he's going to sit down, pushes off the linebacker just a little bit, and Reese is able to get it in there. If he doesn't have the time to do the little bit of a push, then that pass is not completed. Offensive line for Michigan is credit there. Michigan with only three points today. You can see the problems they've had inside the 20, inside the red zone. Big stop by Washell. Looked like it was going to be a huge game for Clarence Williams. He gets about four, and we go back to Mike Dorico. Mike. From Michigan to the banks of Lake Michigan, Northwestern takes the second half kickoff, drives down the field, and a 69-yard drive is capped by a three-yard Darnell Autry touchdown run, his 15th of the year. Northwestern retakes the lead. The darlings of college football, the Wildcats, on top of Ohio State in the conference. Number oh. five in the nation. Purple pride. Purple pride. Good for college football. What a great score. Down to the 11, or it's second and seven. Good protection again for Brian Greasy. Going underneath to his tailback, Chris Howard. It's complete. He's close to the five, O'Keefer. Stopping the running back, but close to another first down, short by a couple. Big situation here on third down, and you know what? Here's my guess: is that because of the fact that they've struggled so much in the kicking game, I think they're in four down territory here. You know, they can go off tackle, do whatever they wanted here on third. Safe pass here, good tackle by O'Keefer. But now you got a situation where you've got third and two. Jamie Washell, who's been a problem earlier, this time they held him out. Zach Adam in the left guard doing a good job protecting his quarterback. They've got the ball in the backfield car. First down marker. Uh, it's going to be short. It appears from this vantage point that he is going to be a little bit short, but as I say, the way the kicking game's been going, I think they're going to go for it. So it's going to be fourth down. Only a foot or two required for the first down. Lloyd Carr's Wolverines, they lead it by three. You know, if they, were, if, they were to, if they were to fake here, any kind of fake, any kind of option, any kind of bootleg, he could just walk into the end zone because they're so jammed up in there. Spotlight on big number 96. William Carr, the junior from Carter High School in Dallas. Fourth and one to the yard. It's Carr. He didn't get it. I don't believe it. Oh, no. no. Boy, what a two great defense effort. comes up big again. And the Boilermakers will get it back. And I got to tell you, Joel, that is just some atrocious play calling got a situation where you got a dominant offensive line all you have to do is take your receivers out set up as you normally set up spread the white shirts out they don't do that they jam them in do the exact same play back to back and they don't come up with it this has got to be depressing for wolverine fans the kind of field position they've had in the second oh half. look at o'connor over the top over the top and o'keefer with him boy i tell you what that's just a great effort by the backers of purdue because you know joel the combination of all the factors that are working against them the weather inside the 20 their gas if they continue to come up with it what an outstanding job at the purdue defense it's amazing they've been shut out todd in the second half starting at the michigan 37 twice and the last one at the michigan 26 don't forget Senior PGA Tour Championship coming up right after our contest in Ann Arbor. And the leaderboard has Jim Colbert on top by three over Ioki, Orko, and Irwin. Five off the pace to join us. Second round coverage of the PGA Senior Tour Championship right after our football on ESPN. And Joel, now the point that you made earlier comes into play. That is that Purdue is going to be going with the win here in the fourth quarter. Will it come back and burn Roy Carr? The decision he made to take the win in the third quarter and set the fourth. Tracker, Tracker goes down. Safety for Michigan. Clarence tops it again with the corner play. Trevsker had any chance at all. 
the junior from King High School in Detroit, giving Michigan their first two points of the second half. Not a bad call by the Michigan defensive coordinator. No, absolutely not. Given the circumstance, he had to think that Greg Mattis was ahead of the game. He was the guy that wasn't surprised by the play-action pass, calling the corner blitz. A gutsy call if the kid looks at the direction, but he doesn't. That's the result. Two points for the Wolverines. So the Wolverines now with a 5 to nothing lead in the 8th inning. 11-47. <laughs> Very good. Left in the contest. And oh, nice. Look at that. Mercury Hayes back at the 16. Cooper, the leading blocker, forget it. Good coverage at the 21 by the Border Makers. So we saw Carr fail on fourth down to start it all off. Gets, gets bad footing, but again, O'Connor and O'Keefe are the ones that make the big play. Purdue has the momentum, but the momentum disappears. Carr's saying, what happened? That plays work. What's the deal? You can read lips right there. That's what he says, what happened? But the momentum was short-lived. Here he comes in the safety blitz. Thompson just hammers Tresker in the end zone. As a result, a 5 nothing lead. Not the first time they've used Thompson on that corner blitz today. Second time, been successful. This time it was a 2 run over. They'll take it. Williams. He'll get it under the leg. And he loses the ball. The offensive lineman, I think, covered it. Was it running in the yeah. left tackle? It was. Yeah. You know what? That was an outstanding recovery. Very close. He had the ball between his shoulder pad and his wrist. Watch the bottom of your screen after the ball is fumbled. O'Keefer sprints over, tries to get O'Keefer's the one that strips it. Now watch the ball where it is. Wedged right. Ooh, just lucky to come up with that. Usually the linemen don't have that good a hand, Joel. What a punch by O'Keefer on the way by. So Runyon avoiding disaster for Michigan at the 11-minute mark. And now Williams heads over to the bench after that play. And coming into the backfield now, Ed Davis. Loss of three, second and 13. Davis wrapped up by Greg Smith trying the right side. We head back to the studio on Mike Tirico. Mike, what's the latest? Joel, Alabama st started in a 9-0 hole, but they're coming back thanks to the running of Dennis Riddle, who is over 100 yards already today. He has 145, including two on this touchdown run, tied by five. Thanks, Mike. You know, tell number four, you got to know where the ball is. <laughs> yeah, he's a little, a little confused there. No eyes in the back of his head. What's up? So a five to nothing game here in Ann Arbor. The weather conditions have really throttled the two offensive units. And now a third and nine for the Wolverines. The low throw to Mercury Hayes get it? No. It was a trap. Tried to go down and scoop it. Well, I haven't been in that situation before, Joel. Of course, you know that I never begged for catches like that. However, you grovel a little though. <laughs> yeah. I, I could be a little subservient. Watch the ball. Watch the ball. Does he get his hands underneath the ball? That's the question. Does it skip? Well, his hands are underneath it, but right there you can see that the ball hits the grass. He's able to surround it. But his best inability is to no avail with a striped shirt. Now a huge play for the special teams. Harris Harris ready to punt into that fifth win. The end over ender. Otomanani stays away from it. And Purdue will have it at their own 43. So finally, some field position for the border makers. We'll come back and see what they can do with it. Put on a yellow slicker today, and you're wearing team colors for either Purdue or Michigan. Welcome back to Ann Arbor. Joel Myers, along with Doc Christensen. First and 10 of the 43 for the border makers. He's got 10 minutes left in the contest. Dutcher finally has some time. And throws it short the intended target, looking for Charlie Stevens' tight end. Same situation. <laughs> the receiver's trying to beg for that ball, but the ball hit the grass. Tough day for Tresker. Three for eight. Tough day for the ground game of the Purdue Boilermakers, oh. and they had to have a big day on the ground. Absolutely. You can see there 11 plays, 13 yards. A great deal of that is because of the poor field position and the weather, but it's the running game, as you pointed out. I mean, you can see, we mentioned at the top of the show, 252 yards a game first in the Big Ten. The defense for Michigan has been outstanding, only 34 yards thus far today. Second and ten situation. Way to the back of the border, and he's finally in the fourth quarter. Dresser with 
time on disposal wide open receiver once again. He had all for that time, his favorite target so far this season. Well, he got some pressure that time. Ben Huff, the defensive tackle, was in his face, but that now that's back-to-back -back hook patterns from each side of the field that they've attempted, and as you mentioned, both cases the receivers were open, but Trevor has not been able to deliver. So after starting his last two drives with his own three-yard line, at his own five-yard line, the start of five resulted in the safety. Now Trevor has it the 40 swing, but he's looking at a third and ten. Michigan did in that situation is they decided they wanted to come with the blitz, which surprised me considering it was third and so long. Watch the inside backers are going to come on the blitz. Trevsker's got his man, man for man. He's got it. You're right. He has to slow up just a little bit. And as a result of slowing up, Isaac Jones is not able to come up with a first down. So now Degnan in to punt it away once again. And Amani Tuber waits back at the 10. Michigan has it back when we return to leading by five. The old man winner is shut down the two offensive units of Michigan and Purdue. Five to nothing to leave for the Boilermakers. It had to happen. Scott Nine and Arbor. Well, that's Scott. He's freezing. He's throwing on first down. Got his back underneath, wide open across the 30. Chris Howard, and they pick up the first down all the way to the 34. The ESPN presentation of college football is being brought to you this afternoon by the new Dodge. We're thinking ahead. That's a big play in this game. It is. Huge play. Yeah, it is. They caught him in the zone. They caught him in the zone defense. Crossing pattern got the back underneath. O'Connor is a little bit deep in his drive. Able to pick up 19 yards. We should make an addendum to that note with regards to 1900. The last Wolverine team to score five points. That was the last Wolverine football team to score five. So now we should make that.
telling you, he's got some wheels. Just that burst in midfield. Top second half of the season for Dan Henning's squad lately. Yeah, it really is. So down second and ten. They'll give him back the original line of scrimmage on the run by Floyd. The new running back taking over the single set is Clarence Williams on second and ten.
one line driver. And this time Coomer's going to have the opportunity for the 16. They've got a bounce across the 25, so decent operating position now when we come back for the Wolverines at their own 27 on by 5 Souls at Michigan Stadium, and you've got to be a hearty bunch to still be here at this point. 5 0 ball game, 5 24 left. Now, to the Wolverines take some time off the clock. The tailback going nowhere is Clarence Williams, true freshman out of Cass State in Detroit. Now, Purdue has to take some chances here defensively. They're going to have to come with some blitzes, and even though they don't want to do it with those two wide receivers, they're going to have to go with some man coverage. Now, now the pressure then becomes a, uh, comes upon the shoulders of Brian Reese to be able to pick that up because they've got to go with the eight-man front here because they know that Michigan's just trying to run the clock out. And every first down, just about 90 seconds off the clock with a fresh set for the Wolverines. It is a second-and-eight situation coming up. All three timeouts remaining for Purdue as well as Michigan. in by Chris Howard. He was the featured back in the last possession. He takes it to the 33 near the 34 brought down by Craig Williams. The very thing that I was talking about didn't transpire and that's that they decided that they had four deep in the secondary which I don't understand. You can't have seven in the box here. You know that Michigan is going to run the ball. Purdue in that case had four people in the secondary. I don't understand that. Take a look back here. You've got three safety. You've only got seven up front. And as a result, you've got a six, seven yard game. This is where Purdue has to take some chances. They've got to come up with some people in the box. Go man on the outside. They cannot afford to let Michigan get a first down. So the biggest third down of the contest for the Wolverines to hang on to the ball inside of four minutes to play. They've got the cushion in the corner. Kilmer makes the grab for the first down. It especially helps when your quarterback Coleman flips down. Well, not only slips down, but again, he's eight, nine yards off the ball. That's an absolute gimme for Greasy and, and Schumer. Schumer is somebody that certainly has to be frustrated this year. Schumer was the guy last year, 1,096 yards, set a receiving record for Michigan and led the Big Ten this year. He has struggled as a result of the quarterback changes, but right there, certainly a big catch for a first down for Michigan. break after the first down for Purdue because they have not restarted the clock after setting the chain. It is still stopped at 347. First and 10 for the 43. Strike guard move. Dead ball foul coming up against the offense. This is, this is the sort of thing that just drives a coach crazy. Other scores from around the country. Ball, ball start, on the offense, five yard penalty, clock out for the three, four, uh, three, three, four, three, four, three, take a look at the right guard, Joe Marinero, the guy that's going, the guy that's going to move, you saw him right there, move a little bit too soon, and the official is right, no clock, no time should have come off the clock, and it was at 347, so as you pointed out, Joel, they went out of no two made the catch. He was out of bounds. Clock does not restart. Now they come up first and 15. Joe, Jim Coletta now has to be thinking about the possibility of using his timeouts for series. They shut down Jim Coletta's ground game. That's the biggest problem for the Boilermakers today. The lowest total on the ground, 143 yards early to this year. They have not broken the 50 yard mark on the ground today. The Razzle Dazzle, yes. Mercury Hayes on the reverse. They were worried about it. Couldn't make the stop. It's across the midfield, driving close to a first down. He is just inside the 48. Needed to go near the 47. Paul read it very well. He just lost his footing. Yeah, he did. That was tough in the open field. This is one of the most conservative razzle dazzle plays. Look at how careful the handoffs are. If you notice, if you notice that their 26 did it with two hands to make sure that he got it. And as you mentioned, you saw the footing. Paul just skates down. He's not able to make the play. Hayes just a little bit short, I believe. Two carries, 26 yards for Mercury Hayes, the senior from Washington High School in Houston. And by a couple of inches, you will come up short. But it's only 
second down coming up for the Wolverines at the same time. After the markoff, it was first and 15. Once again, you got to give Fred Jackson, offensive corner for Michigan, some credit with that because you had, you had to figure that, wait, 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 you know, in this kind of weather, you may, might not want to risk those kind of handoffs. As we mentioned, the two-handed handoff by Taylor enabled Mercury Hayes to be safe enough to get close to the first down. And after Michigan picks up the first down, Todd, a decision to be made for Jim Coletto and his staff because they've got all three timeouts left. Do they start using them now? Yeah, I would think so. I don't think they have a choice because after they get this first down, which now, you know, if he gets the first down, it'll be 3.30 and the clock running. I think he has to. The second and inches inside the 48 of the border makers. more though. He's down inside the 47. Washell tripping him up. Solid day up front again for Jamie Washell. The coaches told us earlier in the week playing the best football of his Purdue career. Senior from Greenwood, Indiana. Three years starter. Well, he certainly had a great day today. The running attack in fairness, of course, to Michigan with Bianca Batuka with the calf strain coming out. The running backs by committee have not damaged the front of Purdue. The two first downs came in the first down. Purdue does not have a first down. Actually, they've got one in the second half, one in the first down. Davis will stay in bounds. The ultimate situation now is Bob O'Connor wraps up the running back and Will Purdue stop it? Yes, they use the first timeout. We'll take a timeout and head over to Mike Tirico. Mike? Okay, Joe, we'll send you up to Boston where Miami's 14-0 lead is no more. 69-yard drive, Steve Everson, three yards, spikes it over the goal line to get in. BC now down just seven, trying to hold Miami. Meantime, in Evanston, that first drive of the second half score by the Wildcats standing up. They lead Iowa by four in the fourth. Bill, what a comeback, Mike, by Iowa to make it that tight and lead to that point where Northwestern got that touchdown to finally take the lead early in the fourth quarter after what Illinois did to Iowa last Saturday on ESPN. College Hoops, are you ready for Dickie V? I don't know about you, but I am. Preseason NIT on ESPN. Full slate. It all begins on Wednesday. Manhattan, Georgia Tech, DePaul, Michigan, Weber State, Fresno State. The Shark is back. Jerry Tarkanian's first game at Fresno State. And then at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN2, Long Beach State and Arizona. 400 college basketball games on ESPN and ESPN2 this year. Get ready, you hoopaholics. It is going to be a great, great time. As usual, college basketball already here. And boy, they've got some players. They've got a young man coming into Michigan. Michigan is definitely a top 20 oh. candidate this year. He's a bruiser. Who do you like? You like Kentucky? Uh, Kentucky, like Kansas, UCLA, Maryland's got a good squad. Anybody can say that. I'm asking, who do you like? Uh, Kentucky. Okay. <laughs> We're not, not to like Where Kentucky you this year. <laughs> Five to nothing, Michigan up. 247 left, a second and nine coming up for Lawrence Carr squad. And they're down to the two timeouts remaining. Two timeouts left now for Purdue. You take the chance of the sophomore quarterback and put it up, or do you force them just to use all their timeouts? Well, the way the corners have been playing for Purdue, I really like that hit drop. Second and nine. Michigan. 
Good call again by Fred Jackson with the fake reverse. Davis cuts up field. Crick, as you mentioned on the tackle, he's going to be, going to be a yard short. Now while they deliberate on fourth down, let's check in again with Mike Tirico. Mike? We'll take this time out to remind you that golf is coming up at 3 Eastern, the Energizer Senior Tour Championship. Let's get you updated on some scores right now in the top 25. Northwestern holding on to that four-point lead. They've lost their linebacker, Fitzgerald. Florida State, North Carolina just recovered an onside kick. Virginia has scored 21 unanswered to lead their game. Other games include Clemson looking for four in a row. Their defense has been great. K-State up two touchdowns. Scoreless in the second, Missouri and Colorado. Arkansas, early lead over Southwest Louisiana. Alabama, 14 unanswered. Virginia Tech, two defensive scores in their lead over Temple. And some other games include Alex Smith of Indiana, who ran for, I think, 22 first-half carries in the first quarter, I should say. That's an NCAA record, but Indiana's still down 17. Send it back to Joel in Ann Arbor. All right, Mike, Jim Coletto is Purdue Barnabakers out of timeouts now. The decision for Lori Starr's Wolverines. They go for it on fourth and a yard and a half. They take up the first down. It's essentially over. Yeah, that's right. And, of course, the way Purdue has struggled offensively, that's what they've got to be considering here, and that's exactly what they are going to do. The offense is going on the field. So Brian Greasy leading the offensive unit out. In the backfield, George Charles, the fullback, and Davis, the tailback, on fourth and a little more than a yard. just the tackles and tackle for loss, but the fact that Mike Allstop not only didn't get 100 yards or anywhere near his average, it was the fact that he didn't break Purdue's record, 35 yards. And Kelly Springfield is proud to donate $1,000 to each school's general scholarship fund on behalf of these fine scholar athletes. So now, Michigan will punt the ball away. Much to the chagrin, I might add, of the faithful here at Michigan Stadium. They wanted to see their team go for it on fourth down. And your broadcast partner. <laughs> you really like it. Uh, I'm just weary of the hut 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 Well, we're going to see Nate DeLong, the sophomore's first punt of the day. They've been going to the Terraceras all day long. Back deep. It is going to be Ola Madani. It's not Dean Allen back there. He bumped that one that was recovered at the two by Michigan. Ola Madani, the senior. Trooper City for it. was John Tom Ola Madani, the defensive coordinator for the Miami Dolphins. drive for the Bordermakers, but they do have plenty of time, and don't forget, coming up next, final of the year, the Senior PGA Tour Championship right after our football in Ann Arbor. Second round leader, Jim Colbert, up by three over Ioki and five on top of Wargo and Irwin. So stick around. Great golf from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, right after our college football on ESPN. You know, for somebody that hasn't done anything all day long, you got to say that that's a pretty thick feel to come in there one time. He made the long right there, come in and send him inside the 10 yards. That's, that's got to be a great feeling for that youngster. The two-way player car gets set in his chance. The member of the front four for the Wolverines. We'll also see it on the offensive backfield. Petzger on first down from the nine. Short game to the 14. Taking it in, Automadotti on that side. But again, had to stop and wait. Put down by... Lose safety. And Woodson was over there as well, the cornerback. They're now second and five for the 14. He's cutting time, running inside of two minutes left. Joel, for a team that's used to running the ball close to 40 times a game, it's obvious that the two minute drill is not their foot day. Ball starts, pocket. Not exactly what they needed. It'll be second and 10. 83 yards offensively today. Miserable.
terrible day weather-wise, but Michigan has been able to cope a lot better than Purdue. Let's give credit to the Purdue defense. One of the best the Big Ten, especially in stopping the run. They set up the speed to Allshot. Allshot waiting. And he's going to be buried short of the dead. They're out of timeouts. Down to 90 seconds left in the game. Well, Jared Irons came through that completely untouched. Even though he didn't make the tackle, he was the guy that was there first to get in the way. It's not a bad call, but you got to block it. They're now third and nine from the 10. Good protection for the quarterback. He's got offers. He's at the 25. And almost breaks it to the boundary. What a tackle by Charles Woodson. First down, Purdue. You're right. That was a huge tackle, Joel, because they had the momentum in the maize and blue are going in the other direction. If Woodson doesn't make that tackle, he's at least in this field. Michigan by only five. Box the clock momentarily for the movement of the game for the first down. Fred Church underneath has Adamadani. Can he get the boundary? Yes, he gets out of bounds across the 40 at the 41. He was able to do that because Woodson slipped down. He had the short hook route. Of course, it only picked up about eight yards. But what it did do is stop the clock and move the forward a little bit. Woodson slipped down on the play. A bunch of what-ifs in Purdue sustains a drive here. And Lloyd Carr had the opportunity to go for it on fourth down. Todd Christensen was talking about it. Yard, yard and a half. They decided not to. They could have run up the clock to Purdue and used all their time out. Now exactly 60 seconds left. And a second is short for the border makers. Dump it off. That's Watson the tailback. He's going to be short the first down. Barely got back to the original line. And don't forget, they can't stop the clock. He didn't get out of bounds. Beasel making the big play. Yeah, I really don't like that call. Not just because they didn't get it, but if for whatever reason they did get it, all the people are scattered all over the field. They have a very difficult time getting back. They're now third and along two, almost three. Out of the dotty. Will he get there? No. Woodson will make sure he doesn't get out of bounds. He gets the first down to stop it momentarily. It'll restart when they move the chain, so from the 45. You know, for a true freshman, he is making some heady plays, not only preventing him from going out of bounds, but almost stripping the ball. Woodson is having an outstanding day. Don't forget, he had that great kick earlier. Inside of 30 seconds and counting. Out of the dotty, coming up lame on the near side. And that's going to cost Purdue time. You have, to, you have to question that because of all of a sudden he fell down like a drunken sailor. Then suddenly he's up and sprinting to the sidelines. No wonder the crowd's booing. Dredger spikes it. Stops the clock. Only 17 seconds remaining. Does that fall under the heading of gamesmanship, Joel? Well, I thought maybe it was a leg injury, maybe a cramp or something like that, because he went down and he grabbed the back of this like his hamstring. Okay, but then all of a sudden, boom, a sprinter. It was a two-and-a-half-second cramp. Senior Tour Championship coming up next on ESPN. Still, the big play, the possibility there for Jim Coletto with 17 seconds left. The second and 10. No real deep center field right now for the Dayton. Fetcher in trouble and on his way down. The big play made by Glenn Steele. And that may very well do it. They count it down at Michigan Stadium. And the Wolverines hang on. A shot out of the border makers. Final score. Michigan 5. Purdue nothing. Coming up next, the Senior PGA Tour Championship for Doc Christians and our entire ESPN crew. I'm Joel Myers. Thanks for joining us. So long, everybody, from Ann Arbor.